Coming up tonight, we have a great show. I've got grief expert Nancy Gordon talking to us about pet loss and grief. Right after Nancy, I've got Cody in the chat box. He's gonna to talk to us about why he's staring at the wall. Stay where you are, we'll be starting in just a moment. Welcome to the Animals Television Show everyone, I'm your host Romy Bueller and we've got a great show coming up around grief and pet loss. It's a really important conversation and it's one I'm sure many of you are very familiar with. I'm going to be talking to Nancy Gordon. Now she's a licensed clinical social worker, she's a certified life coach, she's an international number one best-selling author and speaker and as a loss and transformational grief expert Nancy's passion is to help guide pet parents through that heartbreaking journey of pet loss and grief. Right after Nancy, I'm going to be talking to Cody. Now Cody's been staring at the wall, hiding downstairs, following his mum and dad around the house and doing some unusual things. We get to chat to him about that and see what's going on. First up though, let's go and meet Nancy. Hi Nancy, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to be talking to you today because grief and pet loss is a favorite subject of mine, I guess, and I have so many people every week that I talk to that are either making that decision, do I uh, let them pass naturally or do I assist them, their pre-grief leading into that or animals that have even um, been stolen or gone missing and, you know, they, they're kind of grieving because they should have done more or could have done better or that sort of thing. And also um, the animals that have had a long, drawn-out, health issue and they're coming to their end or old age or that sort of thing so I see a lot of this all of the time and the guilt that goes with with the grief is quite profound so this is such an important topic and I'm really uh, really excited to hear from you but you've had an extraordinary journey and I would love if you could share a little bit of that with our viewers where you've sort of come from and and where you're at now and then we'll kind of come into the grief side Sure. Thanks for having me. This is this is such a wonderful thing that you're doing. And um, I do know so much about grief from my own experience, as well as working with clients and guilt, just to add to what you were saying, guilt is the number one um, most excruciating part of the grief journey that uh, many people don't really deal with. And that's what I, I help people with. Mm. So, to go back to where it all began, I was, um, I am a licensed clinical social worker and I had a private practice um, and my life was going great. I had, um, you know, so I was sort of living the dream. And then one day I had a life defining moment when I had a car crash. 
and everything went, once the metal of our two cars hit my my path was forever changed and it was um, six years while I was still in practice dealing with this car accident with every you know, symptom undiagnosed. So I had chronic pain. I used a microwave neck wrap for literally 24 seven. And it, it was an excruciating experience. And I finally um, ended up six years after the accident, surrendering to the fact that I couldn't work anymore. So I went on a journey of closing my practice and after, within that year, literally three weeks before my mom got diagnosed with terminal cancer, I discovered this rare breed dog called the Mexican hairless. Oh, can you, I'm too scared to try and pronounce the real name of that dog. Can you just kind of give us a rundown? Because it's like about 20 letters and it starts with X. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's why I said Mexican airless. Uh, <laughs> um, it's called the Xolotl Quintli dog, right. and they go back to the ancient Aztecs over 3,500 years. And in that culture, they were used as spiritual, mystical healing dogs because when they're hairless um, or lightly coated, like my dog Toaster, um, when they're pressed against your skin they you know exude a lot of heat so they're they're like a live heating pad right. and yeah they really are hot and when i found out about this breed they have three sizes toy medium and large um i decided i would get a, a toy size sholo their sholos for short right and put her around my neck and call her toaster so she became my 24-7, no microwave, hot dog, heating pad. And Animal Planet found out about my story and my use of um, this service dog. I trained Toaster as a service dog. Um, and they, they filmed a documentary on our story when Toaster was pregnant. So they, they did a beautiful story. And I got so many... Uh, emails after they aired for years, years and years, yeah. that um, I ended up founding a nonprofit called Sholos for Chronic Pain Relief and placed uh, 18 dogs, including uh, three of Toaster's. One of Toaster's puppies had a bad knee when she was diagnosed at six weeks, when she was six weeks old. And so I kept her and ended up having um, to, she went through a surgery, a knee surgery to fix it. Then she broke that femur um, while she was healing from that surgery. And so I had to, another life defining moment for both my dog, Pink, this was her name. Yes. Uh, and, and myself in that I had to um, agree to having her leg amputated. So Pink became a three-legged dog, and she taught me so, so much about learning to live with my own disability and how to just do it differently and reinvent myself. And they took, they, both Toaster and Pink took me on quite, by the leash, I say, down yes. a path of transformation. How fabulous. I mean, that's, that's what animals do. They're our greatest teachers, aren't they? I love that. Yes. With the, you were saying that you were using heat pads and then toaster. How is that, how was toaster more effective than a heat pad when it's kind of just a, the same concept, if you like? Well, oh gosh, there, that, there, that's a long, there's a long answer to that question. Oh. Because <laughs> there are so many ways. Um, yeah. One of them uh, for example, because I trained her as a service dog, I could take her anywhere. Yeah. And one of our favorite activities was to go to the movies to, in the theater. And what was different about Toaster is that I used to go to movie theaters with a microwave neck wrap, sometimes send my partner out to the popcorn microwave machine to get it reheated in the middle of the movie. 
Yes. Well, I don't have to reheat toaster. Yes. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. <laughs> microwave. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the ways. But, you know, you know, when animals, you know, they're spirits, they're beings, they're healers. Yes. And this breed especially is known as being um, a healing dog and yeah. very empathic and they're very smart. So having her on my neck, you know, was so, it was just, it's like the difference between having, a, you know, a stuffed animal um, or a real animal. There's, there's, you know, the of energy. Course. Yeah. Yeah, you've got that energy healing, isn't it really? Yes. Yeah. Oh, that that's um that's really fascinating. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> I, I interrupted there that that um we were talking about sort of pink and and toaster being quite transformational for your own self. Yes. So part of my journey from the car accident was really um a long process. And Toaster and Pink were very integral to that process. They, um, especially Pink, they really helped me hone down what helped me, what helped me get better. And that became my methodology for healing myself. And I defined seven practices. You know, they got older and they had, they both had debilitating chronic conditions like me. It's so I'm, I'm curious to know, do you find a lot of people whose dogs mirror their illnesses? A hundred percent. Yeah. And I've had a big week of that, actually. I've had a lot of animals with injuries, with emotional conditions. And um, it's been a really interesting, uh, well, Forever I've had that, but for the last week it seems to be quite pronounced the number of mirroring that I've had from pet yeah. parent to, to dogs yeah. particularly this week, yeah. Yeah, it was it was really fascinating to me because I began to see that pattern with Toaster and with Pink. Right. And, and a lot of the times, I mean, for example, Toaster helped me in in like a really empathic, intuitive way early on when I got her, she would, when I'd be at my computer for too long, she would come into the room and she would make sure she got noticed. And every time she got noticed, she would turn her head real fast and walk out the door and then look back at me. And I finally figured out, she's telling me it's time to go to bed. It's time to take a nap. It's time yes. to rest. So, you know, that's just a, a little example of, you know, how that became one of my practices about self-care and simplifying my life. Mm. And, and, you know, she led me to that, to recognize within myself things that I wasn't paying attention to that weren't, you know, helpful for me at that moment. Yes. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of, um, a lot of people that don't pay that particular attention to their animals. I know my my cat particularly, one of them, uh, she's always telling me when it's time to stop work or go to bed or stop eating and and all of those things. She's got a little little signals for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's they're they're really amazing healers. I would love to come into the grief. Now I was reading that you um were talking about anticipatory grief actually, which one of my questions for you kind of sits in in there. It's like, you know, when people know that their animal is passing, they've got fair warning, um, how do you prepare for that? Or do you just kind of roll with the punches a little bit? Well, my with my own experience with Toaster and Pink was very, very profound experience of revisiting really all of my seven practices, but the first practice is surrendering. And what I learned about surrendering with toaster and then with pink was another level deeper than what I understood from what I learned about healing from my chronic illness. 
and resuming a career. What I, what I was really found important was to face the unfaceable. So I, I used to say to my best friend, I, I can't imagine going on without Toaster. You know, and then I would yeah. refer to that movie, They Shoot Horses, Don't They? I don't know if you know right. that. Jane I Fonda. don't know. Oh, it's a long, long decades ago Jane Fonda movie, but it was really a profound movie about grief. And so I used to say, you know, geez, shoot me. I don't know that I can go forward without Toaster. She was so, she was my child, you know, and, mm. and she was my service dog. So that was another layer of, my relationship and my, you know, dependency on her for help in many ways. So when it came time though, and I really saw that Coaster was having compressed problems from her compressed disc that rendered her back legs starting to be very weak, I realized I was going to have to start facing it and I couldn't abandon her. So. Yeah. Um, so I began writing and just of my experience of facing that and right away I realized, oh, this is practice number one. Oh, this is practice number seven. And so I was going through all my seven practices again, yes. wasn't a surprise to me because I knew they were applicable to any, you know, major challenge, but here I was experiencing it like firsthand. What I learned is that the anticipatory grief stage is, is such a window of opportunity for healing, for healing both um, the animal as well as yourself or whoever in the family is around. It's a time where you can really, um, and this is true with humans too, you can um, say things or do things that if you didn't know that you were in that anticipatory stage, you, you might not do. So what I set out to do with Poster was um, plan, I planned uh, what I call lifting her up instead of putting her down with right. a, a mobile vet. And I planned it three weeks in advance. And then those three weeks I took you know, toaster by herself because Pink was a little attention hog. And <laughs> <laughs> what about me? <laughs> toaster was the mama, so she always let Pink, you know, have her way. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and Toaster was just a different kind of personality. So uh, I would take Toaster to the movies just by herself. She'd sit around my neck and, um, I used that anticipatory grief time to really say goodbye, to really honor her, to make her as comfortable as possible. And then I, I had, um, you know, the date set and planned a whole ceremony where they used to sing a, um, with, they were dogs that sang. So we would sing, one of our favorite songs was You Are My Sunshine. Oh, yes. And I played in the background of this ceremony, Celine Dion's version, which is soft and beautiful, and uh, held Toaster in my arms and just really made that a special experience. Now, Toaster, for example, was, unlike Pink, loved to get into chocolate, which you know was toxic. Uh. Yes. She, she'd had her in her 17 years, her, her um, stomach pumped a few times, but I managed to um, coordinate with the vet the right timing to hold a little mini uh, chocolate bar in, her, in my hands that she could lick in those last few minutes. And the look of bliss and like, incredulous. It's like, wow, I get to do this. And she knew what was going on. She absolutely knew. Yes. And yeah. She was, you know, I mean, it was just an amazing experience. So that's an, ex that's an example of not only facing what feels like unfaceable, 
but really using the experience to honor your pet, to really honor your own grief, to, you know, be present. In yeah. That. I imagine that would also help with the guilt. Totally. Of I haven't done enough. Could I have done more? And I mean, you might have those feelings later, but that they, they may be a little bit more acceptable to you when you know that you have um, sort of worked through this beforehand. That's exactly right, and that that is one of the the greatest gifts in figuring out how you can face this. You know, who needs to support you? What kind of support do you need to be able to go through this so that you don't have the guilt? Do you find there is a difference between grieving for a pet versus a human? There are lots of different differences. And I'm, I'm just um, in the process of publishing a book about all of that. Oh, and right. My seven practices. Um, yes. And one of the biggest differences is what we just talked about, which is euthanasia. So we are able to do that with our pets. We're not yeah. able to do that with our humans. It's illegal. And that is both what I've you know, learned from my own experience as well as working with clients that it's a blessing and it's also a burden because what I, what surprised me when I came to that horizon with Toaster of realizing I was going to have to help her sooner than later was all of a sudden I questioned the morality and my right mm. to kill my dog. When I put yeah. it in those terms, I was like, I can't do this. And then I went through a process and talked to a lot of people and got a lot of support and realized that, you know, really, um, especially the way that I did it and I had the time to do it that way yeah. um, was really such a gift to her, such an honor and to me as well and to Pink who was present. And, you know, that was her mama. Yeah, of course, because they, animals grieve each other. That's right. Yeah. And, you know, I find in my own business with the communication with animals that there's, they're all different. You know, they're like people. They have their own personalities. They have their own needs and drives and whatnot. And, and some animals say to me when it comes to that time when the pet parent comes to me and says, I don't know what to do. Do I, are they ready? Um, do they want to die by themselves, et cetera? And it's not a 50-50 split. It's probably 70-30. But, you know, 30% of the animals are, are uh, well, firstly, none of them mind what you do. They, they see death so differently to us But um, because they haven't, as you know, they haven't really gone anywhere. They've just changed planes. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of them are, you know, why the human intervention? Let me just go and park myself under a tree and I'll, I will pass when I'm ready. Let me do it myself. And then the rest of them are, okay, I'm ready now. for. It. And often that is because of the pet parent that is causing a bit of a, an emotional storm around them and they want to help. They're, you know, animals are helping their parent right to the end or right yes. to their end, which is a beautiful thing. Totally. So but they totally. don't blame, no animal I've ever spoken to blames their their parent for any decision they've made, good, bad or indifferent. It's just, you know, they just love. Is there anything that you see that is really common? I mean, there's probably a lot of things, but is there something that you see that's really common amongst people with how they deal with grief or perhaps how they don't deal with grief? The What well, they're ignoring perhaps or? Yes. Um, there, I've had, I have, clients right now who are facing euthanasia tomorrow. And um, just, uh, this is a new client, just reach out to me today. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's planned for tomorrow. I don't know the details yet, but um, what I, what I think a lot of people do, um, for example, another client really put off making the decision until it's almost um, too late. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's more complicated. It's more traumatic. Yes. I think that part of that 
process of when that happens is because people aren't dealing with their grief. They're not dealing with the anticipatory grief. Mm. And, and it's, it's unfortunate. It's not, you know, because it really ends up being more of a traumatic experience than a healing experience of that parting. So yeah. that's, that's one, you know, one example, I think, I, I refer to unhealed grief as putting a lock on your heart. Oh yeah. That's one of the, I love it. one of the biggest benefits um, of doing transformational grief, which is what I do yeah. is, is that you honor yourself and your pet by really going through the grief process at whatever point. For some people, it's very sudden. For some people, you know, it may be a lost animal. It may be, you know, an animal that was hit by a car and you don't have any time. Mm. So, um, you know, all of those different circumstances have an effect on the grieving process. And then each person's own experience with grief and what kind of support they have around them makes a difference in the grieving process. I have talked to um, a number of clients who say, you know, their spouse says, it's been a week, why are you still crying? You know, that's, yeah. that's just so sad. Yes, it, and I just want to ask with that too, because People do grieve in their own time frame. There is no, okay, by this date you should be all sorted, press on. But is there a point, maybe not on a calendar, but is there a point where you should sit back and, and just have a look at, okay, I think I've been sitting in this for too long, What do I? but I still don't know what to do. What do I do? What, what would... What would you recommend for someone that has come to the realisation they've been grieving for four, five, six years or whatever a long term is for an animal or a person too because it's probably very similar? Um, what would you suggest to someone like that? That where, What's their first step? One of the important things to understand about the grief journey is, as you say, there is no timetable. And the role of the relationship and the depth of the relationship really grief mirrors. So the for the pet parents that whose whose pets are like their children, it's mm -hmm. a different experience than a family pet or dog that sleeps out in the yard or is a, yes. a farm animal. So all of that determines the differences. And so what people um this is why one of my missions is to really help educate the world about grief and loss, because the less you understand about grief, the, the more difficult the journey is. And, and um, so if you understand that all the variables that go into your own particular grief and every grief is different, yeah. whether it's human or animal, because the relationship is different. You know, I had a totally different experience of uh, lifting up pink nine months after Toaster because my experience, my relationship with her and the whole, all the factors that went into her needing to be lifted up were different than Toaster's. She was much sicker. Where people, you know, can start is getting some education about grief the grief process, whether that's through books, whether that's through, you know, learning online or whether that's seeking a professional support. I think the biggest indicator when there is a problem with somebody's timetable of grief is that the grief is affecting them from moving on in very significant ways in their life. I've yes. had, for example, I've had clients who have said, I just actually did a poll on Instagram uh, a couple of days ago with, you know, asking people, you know, do you plan on getting another one right away? Do you plan on, um, 
getting one when you feel your grief is healed? And do you plan on never getting another one? And I have clients, I have, and, and people answered, most of the people that answered that poll said, I'm not getting another one. So those are the people who have a lock on their heart. The grief has just imprisoned them. When that is, you know, a sort of a common theme in your life, and it's probably not just with the animals, but any traumas, um, that's when grief, when people really need to get help. We're not going to get out of this life without grief of some form. And I think, you know, what, you're t what you mentioned before about educating yourself around the grief process or, you know, grief in itself is really an important um, piece of information because it's maybe it, we just kind of wait for a grief to hit us and then we might get educated, which is okay. Um, but I don't know, there's almost a forewarned, forearmed kind of feeling to it, isn't there? And it doesn't make it necessarily less sad because it's always going to be sad, but That's you've right. got some, you know, you've got the background and you've got some steps that you can work through. And what do you find with, um, you know, we just touched on it briefly with, I work with missing animals um, quite, quite often. And a lot of these have been gone for six, 12 months, two years, three years, however long. Uh, they are probably not coming back. They have passed while they've been out there, they've been stolen, of course. There's that scenario as well. Some animals leave because they don't want to be in their home anymore for mm -hmm. various reasons. Uh, but that is heartbreaking for the pet parent that loves that animal and there's no closure. Uh, how do, I mean, that's a part of the grieving process, isn't it? There's When there's no closure on something, is there something that you... Um, have discovered with that on, you know, I don't know, some education or what to do with that particular part? I, I think it, it's, it's um, a complex answer because yes. part, of, part of the answer is at some point most people need some sort of closure. Otherwise, mm. it's a sense of haunting. It's a sense of you know, something's always hanging over them and they're just like waiting, waiting, waiting. And that's not necessarily healthy at some point. Yes. So, so people, I think, need to be supported in figuring out when is it okay for them to let go, to have some closure. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily giving up hope, but it means maybe letting go. And in that letting go, maybe there are some, you know, ceremonies, some rituals, um, some letter writing or right. you know, with so many tools to help mm. have closure. Um, that that's a, a, an important part of helping someone move on. Yes, I, I think because saying to someone, you know, you've got to let it go it's been going on too long now, you've got to let it go. And it's like, I don't know how to do that. I can't just say, okay, I'm going to let it go tomorrow at three o'clock because life, human doesn't work like that. But, um, yes, writing and all ceremony and those things. Do you find journaling a really powerful tool for, for some of this? I think journaling is a powerful tool for almost any kind of healing. Yeah. <laughs> of course, I'm a writer, so that, you know. I yes. Yes to me but but no I think it's a really good form of expression and a lot of times as people write especially if they do it by hand and not on the computer mm -hmm. they they uncover just because the unconscious starts coming through the pen they uncover things that they weren't really aware of or they were defending against and it just comes out on paper yes and I love that part of how they educate themselves about where they are in the process. Mm. And that's, you know, awareness is the first step of healing, of any healing. Yes, yeah. It makes me think of art therapy and, and those types of things, of, you know, colouring in and painting and, and I, coming into that meditative space, I guess, where there is, there is space for the subconscious to come through. That's right. I use a lot of um, art therapy in terms of collages. Um, oh, yeah. 
making collages of their pets. You know, that's a that's a uh, often a way that I've found with clients that it's been very healing to put a bunch of pictures together in a way in a and in a format that they can frame or they can have or it's a puzzle or whatever it is um mm. and and reframe how they look at those pictures so you know the whole journey of grief is about not that the grief necessarily ever goes away, human or pet loss. Yes. That it changes how it affects you. That's the work. Yep. Not only does it how it's affecting you, but in transformative grief, it's how you can use grief to change you, to heal things that weren't healed before, to make a difference in how you live your life now and how you are in relationships going forward with other people. I'm working right now with a client whose two dogs um, passed the uh, end of last year in COVID a month apart and she'd had them for a very long time and they were her children. Yes. And she's stuck in, um, in that process and getting her unstuck is part of recognizing that the relationship she had with these dogs were her main source of joy. That's where she got all those endorphins, all the good stuff. We know what that's like. We've yeah. had, you know, that's what we experience with our animals. And she doesn't know how to get that from a relationship. And so we're, so work we're working on, okay, your, your dogs are gone. They're, you're not going to have that source of joy with them. And she got another dog, you know, soon after. And it's, you know, not, it's not her other children. So mm -hmm. she's not, it, it's a different personality too. So she's not getting that joy from even this, dog but you know she's open to unlocking that grief unlocking her heart and doing the grief work so that she's now hopeful that she can find joy like that with someone that's huge mm. huge yeah and and honoring her do two dogs because what do dogs teach us they teach us self-love through their unconditional love. And without self-love, it's very hard to take in other people's love. Human exactly. love. Exactly. Exactly. So and, you know, we need that it makes me think about how we need to find happiness from within, not, and not to say that dogs are, or cats or horses are external, but they can't make us happy you know so I mean they they do we love it, it's kind of a different a different kind of happiness I guess it's like you you've got to be happy within and that is just a bonus um, to light your fire right. and you know it's I think it's uh, such great work that you're doing Nancy too because it's really really hard I've had so many animals die or Passover is probably a better word, myself mm -hmm. through my through my lifetime. And there will be more because I've got a 15-year-old dog who's not going to be around forever. But And then, I'll, you know, we keep animal people buy other animals or bring other animals into their homes. So it's when you can't deal with these things yourself or when you don't even know that you need to, to um, to have someone like you that can actually help guide you through it and mm -hmm. help you see what you're not seeing yeah. and and just find find that path back to the light which doesn't mean you know you don't have to feel guilty that you're you've moved on because mm -hmm. a lot of people don't want to buy another animal or bring another animal into their house because that's kind of a betrayal 
to the ones that have passed where they're probably up there in doggy heaven going, come on, <laughs> <laughs> just, just go find yourself another friend, save someone from a rescue centre or something like that. So um, I, love, I love what you're doing. Are you available internationally? Yeah, we have the internet. I mean, it's I mean, don't we love it? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so yes. here we are. Yes, I, I work with people all over. Well, that's excellent. I'm going to, we've got um, your web details there. I'm going to put some more information up uh, on the pages and also on the show for people to um, find you. And, um, you know, this is happening all day, every day, whether it's a past animal, whether it's a person even, because... And like I said, we're not going to get out of this life without grief of some form. So if we have someone to step us through it, fantastic. Right. What what I say what I say is that our first experience of grief is our birth. When you think about it, we are say in that safe, warm womb. All of a sudden, we're out. It's cold. It's bright. We start crying. That's the first sign of grief. That's, you know, that little infant just born is grieving that safe place. Yes. So we experience it in many ways all through our life, a divorce, a lost job, uh, you know, children going off to college. I mean, it, there's just no end to it. And so that's why um, it's so important to learn and face your grief, to learn how to face your grief and to do the grief work. And, and it does get easier, not the grief itself, but the work itself. Yes. The journey gets easier the more that you embrace grief. It can be quite interesting, isn't it? If you, if you hover above yourself like an eagle and just observe your behaviour and observe how you are dealing and processing that grief, it can be enlightening, but it can be quite interesting just to yeah. see, sort of get yourself out of yourself and watch and say, gee, that's, am I doing that? Wow, that's really interesting. And that can help too to almost witness yourself rather than be in your own way. Yes, abs that's an absolutely brilliant way to frame that process, that the benefit of that process. Mm. Really, yeah. Really, I like that. Before we finish off, um, Nancy, do you have any um, books or courses or obviously you can do one-on-ones with people over Zoom and things like that, but do you have anything available that people can, that we can direct people to that they could read or? Um... Well, I'm coming, I'm coming out with a book um, on called From Hurting to Healing Pet Loss, Seven Powerful Practices to Manage Your Mind and Heal Your Heart. And um, you can get on the waiting list for the pre-sale of that book. Um, Great. I'll get that information from you and I'll post that up. Yes, yes. And then um, I'm going to also do sort of a short, more sort of like Pet Grief 101, where people can get some of, you know, the kinds of things we've been talking about today and sort of snapshot version. So again, just contact me for that. And then I um, have, you know, working with people one on one is a, a lot of what I seem to do for at least a certain portion of people's pet loss, um, because they really just need that individual times, their own situation. But I specialize in groups. I love groups. They're so powerful for healing. Mm. So um yeah, I, I will be making an online support group. And I do have a Facebook, Transformational Pet Loss Facebook group. Right. At no cost and get support. Support, that's what we need um, when things like this happen. Um, even if we don't feel like we need to, we just need to know that there's someone around that gets what's happened and what, what we're going through. Uh, right. And reading other people's stories, which is that group concept, isn't it? Reading other people's stories, hearing them, it's, there may be something in there that makes us think, oh, that's me. I get that. I want to follow that path. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and your stories with us, Nancy. Everybody out there, if you are animal lovers or people lovers and you are coming into that time or you're already in that grief process or you have been and you still feel like you need something to pull you through, 
uh, please feel free to contact Nancy and I will be back in just a moment because we've got the chat box coming up and we have Cody in the chat box this week. So stick around. We'll be back in just a moment. box is the segment where I get to have a chat with some of our viewers animals. Now it's not a verbal conversation like I'd ordinarily have with someone. It's a conversation using the language of animals where we transfer images, words and feelings from one to the other. I can smell on behalf of an animal. I can taste what they taste, hear what they hear. I can feel in their body what they feel. And you can gather a lot of information communicating this way from behavioural issues to emotional and mental health issues. I can taste their food and I can feel in their body where they're unwell or where they're injured. This is often referred to as animal communication. Right now, we have some animals waiting for us in the chat box. Let's go see who they are and what they've got to say to us today. Developed uh, since we moved uh, to our town home two years ago, he started to follow me and my husband actually wherever we go. You know, if we go upstairs, he follows us upstairs. If we go and change in the bedroom, we change. Uh, he follows us. Even if I go to the bathroom, he follows us there. So um, I don't know if this is an insecurity because. He knows we're not leaving him. I don't know what goes on in his mind. And sometimes, you know, if there's a little shadow, he would not really, like, he would stop and just, like, what he would look. And then he would get up all his courage and step over this whatever it is. And then also he likes to stare at the wall. At the wall. He looks <laughs> like a porcelain dog. You know, he faces the corner and just like this. And then he also um, runs down the stairs and he loves to be in the garage. Like it's the weirdest place of all places. You know, the garage is warm down there. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just a bit weird lately. I want to keep listening to what he's got to say. What's wrong with me? Why do I feel this way? I feel a little bit odd and I don't really know what it is. And when I stare at the wall, it's like pressing the reset button. It's like I'm finding a spot that I can look at that makes everything stable and steady. Things have been going downhill for a couple of years for me and because it, I want to separate, like he's in really good health, like his physical health is really good, but there's this other part that is a little bit, little bit wobbly. When I have a look at the brain, I'm just kind of getting shown a big brain to small, big to small, big to small. It's just kind of repeating. And what what I see with that, a dementia or something like that, mm -hmm. which is very common, I have to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They might I mean, be. After all, he'll be 12 years old. I mean, yeah. Yeah. we all develop little aging difficulties. We do. I know, what do they call it, twilight twilight hour or something like this, when the sun starts to go down. So is there a particular time of day that you've noticed this? Evenings. Yeah. Yeah, because that, that's the time of day that I just can't remember what it's called. It's twilight hour. It might even be twilight hour or, or mm -hmm. anyway, whatever it is, um, it often happens sort of at night time. If I go downstairs, it's sort of, it's like he's trying to to try another way to, to reset the button. But there's also an energy down there that he's checking on. I feel like I can see a baby wrapped, like a baby baby wrapped up in its blankets. Someone that's that's obviously passed on that land, so it could be old or in the in the house itself. Do you know much about the past? 
Well, this is a new construction where we live, um, but the grounds was an old church. That's what uh, I know. Right. Okay. Right. Right. He's checking the baby. Like I just hear he's checking the baby. I'm checking on the baby. That's why I feel like he goes downstairs. That I wouldn't be concerned about. Um, mm -hmm. The baby doesn't need to be there. So it would be a good thing for you to um, do a bit of a house cleanse, mm -hmm. send it to the light effectively. The baby's not the only one in your house. I feel like there's quite a lot of activity actually. It would make sense. That's the only explanation why Cody is so sometimes restless. And sometimes I think, does he see a ghost or or... You know, we would even joke about it, but... Yes, it doesn't feel dark or broody or any of mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. It feels mm -hmm. like a whole lot of people standing around having a cup of tea and a chat, All which right. would probably be, you know, perhaps what they do after church. So <laughs> it's like there's, there's just kind of people everywhere. Him following you around, that's just a dog thing. It's okay. a helping you, mm -hmm. making sure that you're getting where you need to go. Okay. Making sure, making sure that he knows where you are. Because mm -hmm. he seems mellow. It's just like he likes me too much. There's something he wants me to tell you that he doesn't like, though. I'm getting the word crispness and like you're breaking something. It's like breaking a celery stick. Or... I mean, I have big cookies. Obviously, ah. he loves those cookies and I need to break them. Ah. They're, they're yes. big. He doesn't like you breaking it because he doesn't want to share it. He doesn't understand why he can't get the whole cookie. And why are there so many restrictions? That cookie is that big. And I, of course, I'm cheap. I don't wanna, first of all, I i don't wanna give him the whole cookie because the box would be gone in no time. So I do quarter it. If I'm in a good mood, they get half of the cookie, but usually I break it in four. What he's suggesting is that you could give him four pieces throughout the day. Okay. Big ones. <laughs> he's also asking um, when the next dress up is. Does that mean anything to you? Do you dress your dogs up? No, um, not really, because I felt like he never really enjoyed it, interestingly. I mean, the last time I dressed him up was probably on Halloween in 2013. <laughs> Right, okay. Mum and her dress-ups. She's very clever. She's very creative. She could do a whole show with us dressed up. He thinks Hagrid looks stupid <laughs> in, in a cape. Don't put, don't put Hagrid in a cape. He's just showing me Hagrid dressed up as a ghost, like having a white sheet over the top of him with eyes cut out. And I okay. have actually two white sheets that I don't need anymore. He's happy for, for you to do something, but he wants you to do something for Halloween. Okay. I think I can manage. And he's also asking for the Halloween to be videoed, not just a photo. <laughs> so he wants you to... He wants to be some movement in it. All right. Okay. Um, I'll make another of that. Oh, goodness. Yes. He's so smart. My dad is so smart. He's just in awe. He's in awe of dad. I just yes. see him going, oh, my God, yes. you're, you're, a, you're a marvel. You are yes. incredible. You're so smart. How, do you, how <laughs> does your mind think that way? I could never think that way. Incredible that you say that and picked up on that. He is in awe of, of, of mm. his dad for sure. But, and there's a whole different... A whole different take on you. I just, I just feel like I'm melting. It's like, oh, she's the salt of the earth. I can't do without her. Aww. She, she is. This is, this is kind of cool. She is my arms and my legs. Aww. She helps me move. She helps me do things. She's always looking after me. She's always worried. She worries too much about me. She's always worried about me. She worries too much about me. She feeds me, she does, she does everything, and it's just like this immense sense of devotion, different, in awe of Dad, just, but devoted to you, absolutely heart-to-heart -heart stuff. Thinks Hagrid's a brat. Thinks, Hag 
thinks Hagrid is a brat, especially with the walking thing, and that because Cody loves, he loves the feeling of the air on his skin, he loves the smells, he loves his whole world oh, lights up when he's outside on walks and Hagrid ruins it for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's the truth. What he's suggesting, he's got an idea. All right. There is so much that a dog's respiratory system gets from sniffing that mm -hmm. like the lungs are really working hard, like you're running, but they're just sniffing something interesting. Mm -hmm. So as long as they can get out for the time that you normally would go out, because Hagrid is lazy. I take them to the woods and they love the woods. Even Hagrid gets like a second fire going when he's yeah. in the woods and the forest and take them swimming and they love that and, and I love it too. There's little creatures that are interesting. There's smells, there's dampness, mm -hmm. there's the different textures under their feet, the different mm -hmm. temperatures mm -hmm. under their feet that Cody just sucks up all of the, all of the outside stuff. Thank you, Sybil. Thank you, Cody and Hagrid as well, because Hagrid is lazy but made a little bit of a feature today. Uh, thanks very much for joining us. Everybody else, I'll be back in just a moment. Make your day richer with The Richard Wilmore Show. Meet amazing musicians, talented actors, brilliant authors, hilarious comedians, and the most creative people in entertainment. Download the KP Media TV app to watch on Apple TV, Roku, and Amazon Fire. That's the end of another show, everyone. Thank you for joining me. Don't forget, subscribe to the YouTube channel, follow the pages, share it around to all your animal-loving family and friends. Thank you for watching. I'm Romy Bueller. I will see you back here next week.